from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Uh, uh, my name is Jim Hudson. I'm the chief of the library's manuscript division. Uh, on, uh, on the stage with me, we have uh, James Romanault, a uh, distinguished trial attorney, uh, partner in the Cleveland firm of Thompson Hine, the author of two books, one about his uh, grand grandfather, who was great-grandfather, who was the uh, it has a wonderful title. He seems to also have been a magician, wasn't he? He was. Uh, a real magician, not just a magician in politics. No, he, yeah, he uh, did both. Uh, the, he, but he was the chairman of the Ohio Democratic Party during the Harding uh, era. Uh, and then, of course, the, uh, the book, one of the books that brings us here on um, uh, Warren Harding, uh, The Harding Affair, Love and Espionage During the Great War, published in 2009. Uh, we also have Dr. Karen Femia, who's an archivist, uh, who, who prepared the papers, the Harding papers, uh, for um, reader use on July 29. Uh, Karen has a PhD from Brown in musicology, yeah. but she's an excellent, excellent historian and, uh, uh, and really, really a first-rate person. And we have uh, Dr. Richard Harding, the grandnephew of President Harding. He, was, uh, he is a psychiatrist on the staff of the University of South Carolina and was the president of the American Psychoanalytic Political Association in 1981 too. American Psychiatric Psych Association. Psych Psychiatric, sorry, okay. <laughs> the, uh, uh, I shouldn't make that mistake since we have Sigmund Freud's papers here, so I, <laughs> I need to apologize for that. Uh, the, um, uh, a very brief description of the uh, Harding papers here, which is probably unnecessary given the, uh, the publicity they've received, but there are about a thousand, the collection, not the papers, the major collection of the papers are in, in the Ohio Historical Society. Uh, there are approximately a thousand pages of letter, uh, these are correspondence between Warren Harding and Carrie Phillips, who was the wife of one of Harding's good friends in Marion, Ohio. Uh, the, um, there was a love affair between the two from uh, 1905 to 1920. The collection, however, only has letters correspondence between 1910 and 1920. Uh, most of the vast majority of the, of the letters, I think all of them probably, I don't know if there are any carry letters in there. There are a few. A few maybe, okay, but the vast majority uh, uh, letters uh, written by Harding and retained, obviously, by Carrie Phillips. Uh, she said she'd written him volume, voluminous numbers of letters, uh, I'm quoting papers, uh, pages for lines, she once reminded him, but the uh, very few of these letters, of her letters, survive. Uh, the Phillips material in the collection is mainly notes, drafts, and memoranda. Uh, it's the library. How did the Library of Congress get this collection? Uh, we got it in the following way. Uh, in 1963, a Harding biographer, Francis Russell, whose biographer, biography of Shadow of Blooming Grave is still probably the most widely read, would you say, Jim, or not? Unfortunately, that's yeah. true. Yeah. <laughs> uh, published in 19, this, the, the Shadow of Blooming Grave, 1968. He. Uh, he turned up in Mary in Ohio looking for some information. He was about Harding. And uh, he was uh, steered to a local lawyer who was the, uh, had been the guardian of Carrie Phillips. Uh, she uh, had been, uh, in 1956, was, had to be put in a nursing home. Not a, she was not a ward of the state, incidentally. We've discovered that recently, uh, thanks to the, the papers that I'll mention in a minute. Uh, she, uh, but the lawyer uh, actually uh, at Carrie's death in 1960 kept the paper, this correspondence that he discovered. Certainly unethically, was that illegally? Uh, 
How would you characterize that? Uh, he was the lawyer representing the estate, and I would say probably unethically, not illegally, but they really, he should have told the daughter of Carrie Phillips that he had the papers in his basement. Right, right. So he, uh, in any case, uh, Russell was uh, put in contact with the lawyer and um, got limited access to them. Uh, I'm summarizing a very complicated story. Uh, and then Russell spread the word and it got into the, the press, got a hold of it. And uh, in the summer of 1964, for instance, there was a front page article in the New York Times about the Harding letters. Um, Harding, uh, Harding's nephew, the father, correct, of Richard, uh, brought a lawsuit uh, right away for infringement of copyright. They, uh, the papers are certainly owned by Kerry Phillips, but the copyright interests were owned by the writer, Warren Harding. The, uh, the suit went on and uh, lasted for about seven years uh, uh, until 1951 when a resolution was reached. The Hardings bought the, bought the papers uh, from Kerry Phillips' uh, heirs and um, in 1972 donated them to the Library of Congress. But an Ohio court had sealed the letters just more or less after the New York Times article in 1964. They'd sealed them on July 29, 1964. So we've had them since 1972, but there was a 50-year embargo on them, and that will expire a week from today. Uh, there's more to the story. Uh, Russell. The, uh, Francis Russell <clears throat> entered into a kind of partnership, a kind of a devil's bargain almost, with, a, with an uh, archivist at the Ohio Historical Society named Kenneth Duckett. Uh, and Duckett, uh, along the way, made several microfilm copies of the letters. Uh, actually, we tried to tra track one of them down that we, a, um, Karen did, and uh, we don't, we, the, institution that was alleged to be holding it did not have it. Hmm. Uh, I don't think we ever know how many, it's not clear how many copies Duckett made. He, he made about seven or eight copies. And it's not clear where any of them, we know where one of them is. One of them turned up in his own personal papers, which he donated to the Western Reserve Historical Society. And Jim learned about this in 2004 and found this a kind of irresistible trove of letters and uh, wrote, the, um, wrote the book that is, as you see so often quoted in the papers. The, um, uh, the, he, uh, at some point, uh, mounted, uh, he transcribed all the letters, which was a kind of a Herculean effort, I think, and mounted them and some of the images on a website that he maintains. And these, these, are, the, these are the images you've seen in the, in the newspapers or on late night talk shows even. Right. Uh, our own collection here, is the security of that collection has never been compromised. No one has ever, ever seen that anything in the, except staff members who've had a chance to perhaps look at them. I never have, just a little bit. Uh, they're in our um, vault in our manuscript division that also contains security classified material. So that's where we've kept them. Um, the, um, what we are going to do uh, is on a week from now, we have, we have scanned the papers uh, and we're going to put them up online. Uh, they are scanned at, uh, 400 DPI, so there'll be a much better, obviously a much better product than uh, any kind of microfilm that's still kicking around. And there are some material, some material in there that's not in the microfilm. Right. So uh, these, as I say, will be online. Uh, we've, we've, uh, as a bonus, we we were fortunate enough to receive a collection, collateral collection, in a way, from the uh, members of. Four great grandsons of Carrie Phillips. Uh, it's a collection of information about about some of the litigation that went on, and it's uh, Harding some Harding letters to the Phillips family, to Phillips' granddaughter Isabel, uh, to Phillips 
daughter, Carrie's daughter, Isabel. And there's some, it's not a large collection, but there's some very interesting things in there. And that also will be put online on the 29th. The, uh, we, uh, so I think uh, uh, we're, we're very happy to have the opportunity to do this in both of these collections. The, um, the library is, uh, as you know, you may not know, we, we are the presidential library in the United States. Uh, these other people are just third rate. <laughs> we have the, paper, the major collections of George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, Andrew Jackson, Abraham Lincoln, <laughs> Theodore Roosevelt, and Woodrow Wilson. And our interest is we're not partisans. We, we've never tried to defend the reputations of the people whose papers we have. But, and even though we don't have the major Harding collection, we tried pretty hard to get it uh, and didn't. Uh, we, we always want to uh, uh, make sure the, the factual information we dispense about papers are correct. So we've done some digging around about Har Harding as well. And uh, it's, I, I don't, didn't know much about Harding when this started. I, I knew one thing about him. I was trained as a diplomatic historian and knew a lot about the 1921 Ro Washington Conference, limited naval arm armaments in the Pacific. But other than that, I said, well, my, you know, well, Harding, this guy, I just sort of went with the flow and thought the guy was uh, sort of a, what did Alice Roosevelt Longworth, whose papers we have here, called him a slob. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, this is the kind of calumny that uh, existed. Uh, but uh, we've, uh, you know, in, in, in attempting to, uh, working on this collection, we've, it, it's astonishing the amount of misinformation about Harding. I, I, it, or, and, and indeed, everybody even connected with him, his wife, Carrie Phillips. Uh, it's unbelievable, and the, the question arises, how did, uh, what's wrong here? What's wrong with the picture? What, why didn't historians or somebody correct some of this stuff? Uh, and we've been, we've been trying a little bit, and we have a nice collection out in the, uh, in the table of some of things we found from our own collections uh, about, about Harding. Uh, so I want to let, I think some of this is really important, and I want to let uh, Karen Femia, who, who found most of this stuff, briefly describe it, and then we'll, we'll go on. Yeah. Good. Very good. Hi. Welcome. Yeah, Jim Hudson asked me to say a few words about the uh, display that's just outside there. I hope you've had a chance to look at it, or if you haven't, maybe afterwards you'll have a chance. There's also a handout with an essay and an item list on it, um, so please take some time to look at that. After hearing about the custodial history of the letters, I'd like you to contemplate the original home of the Harding Phillips correspondence, hidden in a box at the back of a closet for 35 years, while the recipient of those letters grew older, more isolated, and increasingly impoverished. But Carrie Phillips never sold the letters, never published a book, and as far as we know, she never showed the letters to anyone. She's been accused of blackmail, but it's really unclear if she ever cashed in on those letters or made any blackmail money. So the letters remained hidden. It's like so much about Harding, so many things hidden away. Harding died unexpectedly, only two and a half years into his presidency. His wife, Florence, died only 16 months after that. They had no children. Shortly after his death, the Teapot Dome scandal put a cloud over the entire administration. Basically, there was no one to speak for Harding. All of his papers had been left to the Harding Memorial Association in his hometown in Marion, Ohio, where they were closed. It took 40 years for those papers to open for research. Harding's legacy was like an empty room, an echo chamber for rumor, gossip, and even fabrication. Without the materials that historians use, the Harding story was built on hearsay. This is the organizing principle of the Harding display out there. There are so many persistent rumors about Harding that we decided to search our collections for items that related to some of these. The best example of an absolute fabrication is the supposedly mysterious death of Warren Harding, a death rumored to have been suicide or maybe a murderous poisoning by his wife. 
Notions of a suspicious death were cemented into the public mind by con man Ga Gaston Means, whose 1930 book, The Strange Death of President Harding, created the story of Florence poisoning her husband. Although within a year the book was revealed to be a hoax, it is still to this day in print. On display are items from the manuscript division's Joel Boone papers. Boone was a White House physician to Harding, Coolidge, and Hoover, and was one of the doctors in attendance when Harding died. Harding for years had lived with extremely high blood pressure and heart disease. There is no doubt that he died of natural causes. There's a small section in the display dedicated to the popular belief that Harding was a poor writer and mangled the English language. The Agnes Meyer diary entry criticizes a Harding speech and his Ohio accent. But of course, one person's trash is someone else's treasure. Harding was actually a very popular public speaker, and he did not invent the word normalcy. <laughs> Another section deals with the rumor that Harding was part African American. The rumor behind the so-called whispering campaign of 1920, Harding's presidential campaign. We've included two presidential campaign posters, one printed by an African-American political activist from Cleveland, supporting Harding and quoting from one of Harding's speeches that favored civil rights. The other, a Republican Party poster with a Harding family tree intended to silence the whispers and demonstrate the whiteness of the Harding line. While searching for Harding-related material, Alan Tykro, the head of the preparation section of the manuscript division, pointed out a strange manuscript in the Evelyn Walsh McLean papers and asked me to try to figure out what it was and why was it in Evelyn Walsh McLean's papers. Evelyn Walsh McLean, the woman who owned the Hope Diamond, came from a very wealthy family and married the wealthy Ned McLean, who owned the Washington Post. They had a large estate called Friendship in Upper Northwest DC, where McLean Gardens is today. Evelyn was at the top of the Washington social world, good friends with Alice Roosevelt and Florence Harding. I pulled out the McLean box of Warren Harding material and I found that strange manuscript. Its pages pulled from the slanderous and racist 1922 book by William Estabrook Chancellor a professor at the College of Worcester. The professor claimed that Harding had black ancestry. The ripped out pages are heavily edited and with extra pages inserted. Who was editing this book? And then I found a printer's plate for a Klan publication in a Justice Department envelope in 1922 general correspondence file. Why would such things be in Evelyn Walsh McLean's papers? I contacted the archivist at the College of Worcester and she sent me a chancellor handwriting example. The handwriting on those pages is, belongs to Chancellor. The pieces began to fall in place and the old rumors about this book appear to be true. Government confiscation of books, manuscripts, and printer's plates in Ohio transported back to DC for destruction at the McLean estate. Obviously, Evelyn kept some things. Even though there are few extant copies of this book, it is the original print source for many of the rumors about Harding and also the only print source before 1964 that mentions the affair with Carrie Phillips. The first part of the display is devoted to Carrie Fulton Phillips. Although many published sources claim that Harding had multiple affairs, there is only one verified relationship, the 15-year relationship with Carrie Phillips, a lengthy and complicated affair. The items displayed are either part of a recently acquired gift from the Matei family, the great-grandsons of Carrie Phillips, or documents found at the National Archives. From the Phillips Matei collection, we finally have good photographs of Carrie Phillips, as well as her daughter, Isabel. Also from that collection is a set of letters from Harding to Isabel's husband, William Matei, that demonstrates the cordial relationship between the Hardings and Phillipses in the early 1920s. The 1964 personal account written by Isabel, Carrie Phillips' daughter, describes a difficult relationship with her mother and her shock upon learning in 1964 of her mother's affair with Harding. Just to review, uh, Carrie Phillips and her daughter lived in Germany from 1911 to 1914. Carrie Phillips held a pro-German, anti-British viewpoint in foreign affairs. She was opposed to US entry in World War I and stridently expressed her opinions. Some of you may have already read James Robelnaut's book, The Harding Affair, which he will be talking about soon. He, he, um, I think we discovered that. It weaves together uh, a story of romance, politics, and World War I. 
In the end, he concluded that per Carrie Phillips may have been an actual paid spy for the German government during World War I. It was this question that led Jim Hudson to look through German language sources on World War I espionage and then asked me to visit National Archives. Richard Pizer at National Archives suggested the Military Intelligence Division files. Copies of some of the documents I found are on the display also, and they fill in a few of the missing puzzle pieces to the story. We now know why Carrie and Isabel spent August of 1917 at the naval base at Port Jefferson, Long Island. Isabel's fiance Adolf was stationed there. We know that a Mr. Lamson was so offended by Carrie Phillips' pro-German talk that he reported on her in September of 1917 to the Justice Department, and that report went out to military and naval intelligence. For me, the most astonishing documents are the, is the 1917 exchange between the head of military intelligence with then Senator Harding. Carrie Phillips had reportedly called Senator Harding her friend, so the spotlight was on Harding. How well did he know these women, and could he testify to their loyalty? That's kind of creepy. <laughs> uh, Harding responded with a three-page handwritten letter. Isabel is golden, but Carrie, she's intelligent, proud, imprudent in the expression of her opinions. And in his words, quote, the very openness of it would seem to establish its innocuous character, end quote. In other words, if she were a spy, why would she talk this way? Even though this relationship would seem to have been a dangerous liability for a U.S. senator, he never backed away from her. But now it's time for me to back away. <laughs> so. All right. Thank you. Uh, two, more, two more important uh, tasks before we begin a, just a conversation. We have a statement from the Maté family, uh, the donors of this uh, excellent collection that we've both Karen and I have talked about. Uh, and they, they would uh, ask, have asked me to read it. Uh, and then Dr. Richard Harding will make uh, also a presentation. Uh, here's a statement from the Maté family uh, regarding the public release of the Harding Phillips collection by the Library of Congress. Carrie Fulton Phillips is our direct ancestor, and it is our endeavor to have history judge her on fact, not theory or untruth. With that, we ask historical scholars of this era to be cognizant of the extent of misinformation, distortion, and speculation paraded as facts surrounding this woman and this subject. A prime example of this is a theory that not only Carrie but her daughter Isabel were involved in espionage during the direction, under the direction of the German government. To our knowledge, there is no proof of this. Further, this subject was investigated and researched by two United States government agencies, finding no evidence of collusion, merely two women vocal in expressing their pro-German sentiment. Uh, another popularly held yet false notion is that there are no living descendants of Carrie Phillips. Remember, these are four great-grandchildren, great-grandsons. Uh, and uh, this is in deep... <clears throat> a further area of concern to us is the portrayal of how Carrie handled these letters during her lifetime. Even well after the death of President Warren Harding, when there was no alleged payoffs being made, Carrie kept her collection of letters concealed, protecting the legacy of this president. It was only after she lost control of these letters due to old age and infirmity that they came to light. While her correspondence might have shown a certain willingness to cast him in a negative light as means of getting her way, in fact, this less than perfect woman, woman never did, intending, intending instead to take the letters to her grave. Perhaps this stands in testimony to her feelings for this man. While we were not acquainted with Carrie, in our youth we certainly knew her daughter, our grandmother, Elizabeth, Isabel Phillips Maté and can, can assure any and all that she was a woman of grace and honor. Isabel spent her life married to a man she adored and fully supported. She claimed no knowledge of her mother's affair until confronted with the existence of the misappropriated letters from her mother's estate, which are being discussed today. To her, Warren Harding was a close family friend, and the revolution of this adulterous affair was crushing. When this burst into national attention in the 1960s, she's, she was ill with a respiratory condition, emphysema, that would soon cut her life short, and through this she persevered with dignity and determination. 
Isabel, in coordination with the Harding family, sought to establish ownership and gain possession of her mother's assemblage of documents to prevent their untimely publication and so that their originals could be transferred to the Hardings with the understanding that they would be sealed until well after the death of all involved. <laughs> if the decision was Isabel's alone, she would have burned the letters. One might then ask what motivation, what the motivation for her action was. Despite, quote, common knowledge to the contrary, the tie between Warren Harding and the Phillips family was strong until his death in 1923 as documented in the correspondence we offer here today. A letter alluded to by Karen, which states, which says that uh, Carrie Phillips, her husband, and her mother visited, took an automobile trip from Marion, Ohio, to the White House in 1922, and visited Harding. Uh, if the decision, uh, she honored his memory by working with his family on the disposition of these documents so they might do the most good and the least harm. Knowing that this body of papers would eventually be made public, Isabel passed on to her heirs correspondence, documents, and personal notes related to the subject. We as a family have remained silent until the unsealing of the Harding Phillips collection. Upon this milestone, we feel it is appropriate to share these documents passed down to us to be known as the Phillips Mate collection so that a more accurate historical record can be achieved. We would like to thank the team of professionals at the Manuscript Division of the Library of Congress for their work on this collection of important correspondence and for their efforts to provide access to accurate, complete, and balanced information. The research and investigation into the subject has been extremely thorough and has brought more clarity to this story for any and all to understand, respectively, respectfully, the Maté family. So that is the st statement from the four great uh, great-grandsons. And now, uh, Dr. Richard Harding uh, will have the podium uh, for as long as he wishes. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be 45 minutes. <laughs> and then time's up. Means we can all leave after 10 minutes? <laughs> no, much shorter. I'm Richard Harding, grandnephew of Warren Harding and grandson of George Harding, the only brother of the president who survived into adulthood. George's oldest son was my father, George III, and George was in the middle of the heart of the 1964 Harding Affair papers controversy. Uh, we are joining me today are my two brothers, George and Warren, and other family members, and we are delighted to be here. It is with some ambivalence, but with a sense of history, that we are present. Fifty years ago, my father, along with his siblings, acquired the papers, had them sealed, and entrusted them to the Library of Congress. The current generations of Hardings have honored that trust. To our collective knowledge, no individual has seen or had access to the original letters except for staff members, as uh, was mentioned earlier. I was asked to talk just a little bit about the family background, so if you'll indulge me just for a minute. Warren Harding's parents were Ohio frontier farmers as the country came out of the Civil War in 1865. His father's claim to fame that as a soldier for the Army of the Potomac, he went to the White House and shook the hand of Abraham Lincoln. Fifty-five years later, he would return as the father of the 29th president. He and his wife, Phoebe Dickerson, were successful farmers, but they wanted more for their growing family. And so both, both, went to Cleveland Homeopathic Medical School and graduated in Cleveland, Ohio, and began a career in medicine. Their younger, younger son, George, my grandfather, went to the University of Michigan Medical School and followed in their footsteps. Warren, however, uh, finished college, taught for a year, and then got into the newspaper business and took on the Marion Star and made a great success out of it, 
in prosperous Marion, Ohio. My father and his siblings, Warren II, Ruth, Charles, and Mary, had a special relationship with Uncle Warren. And that's what he was always referred to. I don't think, he, I, don't think I ever heard anything but Uncle Warren and Aunt Florence. He filled a void because of the chronic cardiac illness of my grandfather, uh, who had rheumatic fever as a young person and had uh, mitral valve problems, for those of you who remember back in those days. That was common. He, he taught his nephews and nieces to ride bikes, throw baseballs, and do all the things that kids do. And he was present and supportive when their father was very ill, which he was frequently. Now, at his death, President Harding left $10,000 to each niece and nephew. You can figure out how much that would be uh, now, but it would be quite a bit. And they used that for their education, not a Model T Ford, <laughs> as was happening probably now with a lot of kids getting that money. Four of the five of those nieces and nephews graduated from medical school and the fifth from nursing school. This gift and its careful use enabled the family to continue its professional direction uh, for the next several generations. Let me make one point clear. We are not here to deny facts. What happened between two consenting adults over 15 year period, 100 years ago, is not for our family to judge. Clearly, the negative ripple effects of their relationship has been keenly felt, but processed along with the many positive attributes of our ancestor. Why did my father seal the records for 50 years? Well, there are times like now that sometimes I wish he had sealed them for 75 years. <laughs> <laughs> but with only an educated guess, let me surmise, my father and his siblings did not carefully study the letters. It is likely they felt they were protecting their uncle, their beloved uncle, and the close family members who knew him. And as you can remember, it had been a rough time for the last couple of decades before that for Harding, as was mentioned in the uh, presentation. It goes without saying that the Harding family has always considered the letters private documents. With long a tradition of medical practice and public service, we firmly believe that private matters, even for the rich and famous, should remain private. However, as a person of his, interested in history, I've done some, I have some understanding of the uniqueness of high-level governmental leaders' correspondence and its possible significance to historical scholars especially when the correspondence includes discussion with a close confidant of the issues of the day and the important decisions that resulted. In 1963, President Kennedy was assassinated. With the help of the brother and attorney general, the Kennedy papers were collected, retained, sealed, and placed in the Kennedy Library for a 50-year period. Much of that material remains sealed still. My father used this precedent in 1964, and finally in 72, as Mr. Hudson was saying, and chose the, the Library of Congress and felt that this was the proper place for presidential material where it could best be housed and preserved. Now, my father was a devout, no-nonsense person. He understood that a president's personal letters are different than those of the regular citizen. He had hoped, now think of this, 1964, he had hoped that in the calm, cool, political air of 2014, <laughs> <laughs> that there could be a careful review of the letters by historical scholars. He, of course, in 1964, had no idea or could not even imagine that the internet was coming. <laughs> he would not have believed that in 2014, any person in the world would be able to read the letters at their leisure in, a, in their office or at home. 
family has some frustration that now uh, most articles and inquiries so far have focused more on the titillating phrases rather than the meaningful historical content of these letters. So we are proudly here. The symposium has, you know, will focus on a small part of Warren Harding's life. And we were pleased to have some of the positive things corrected the, that uh, were brought up just a few minutes ago. The accomplishments in his life. The Washington Naval Disarmament Conference. The fact that Harding was an early leader in civil rights. That he proposed anti-lynching laws. Only present to do that for generations because it was poison for politics to get in fights with Southern Democrats in, in something like that. The fact that he was in, he was, uh, he reestablished the primacy of the First Amendment after the First World War, where it had been trampled badly. And he created the Budget Bureau and balanced the budget. Pretty impressive. Now, he made the hard choices that all presidents must make and uh, we feel that instead, we're talking about oftentimes, or reading about in newspaper articles, the uh, good man's mistakes, which seem all too common in 20th century political leaders. We as a family feel we did the right thing having fulfilled the trust set up 50 years ago. But history will tell us if we were wise to do so. Now, I challenge uh, you, and I see there are a number of scholars and historians in the audience, a collection of private letters from a key senator and a future president to his confidant during a critical period in American history does not come along often. It is our hope and your responsibility to, be, to not be distracted by the sexually explicit prose that fills parts of these letters, but instead to use all the information in them to reassess the measure of the man. Warren Harding doesn't need protection. He needs honest, hardworking, and fair historians to tell us the story as they see it. Thank you. Good. I'm going to, going to read a, uh, a, an appraisal of President Harding by his physician while he was in the White House, Admiral Joel Boone, and then we'll have the uh, conversation. Uh, uh, the, uh, Boone was a man who won the Medal of Honor during the First World War as a Marine Corps physician in France. And he was then the official uh, the, the presidential doctor, so to speak, for Harding, Coolidge, Hoover, and FDR. And this letter was written in 1959 about Harding. He says, um, I wonder how well or how intimately you knew late President Harding. I didn't, he's writing a friend. I did not uh, know him until his second year in office was some months old. From then on, I had the opportunity to know him intimately as one of his physicians. Uh, I saw him frequently, lived in the White House for four months, September to December 22, during the very serious illness of Mrs. Harding. Accompanied the Hardings to Florida during part of her convalescence, was a member of the presidential party of, on a transcontinental tour into Alaska in the summer of 1923. Was in attendance as, as one of the physicians when President Harding was desperately ill in San Francisco up until the time of his death. Uh, his regular physicians were a reserve naval medical officer and I, his career, a reserve army officer, and I, his career, his uh, career, naval medical officer. No one gets to know a person as well as his, his or her physician does, uh, nor does anyone come in as intimate, become as intimate and have personal contact with him as his physician. From personal acquaintance, I observe no sordid side of President Harding. I do know of a gracious, gentlemanly, courteous, kindly, industrious, conscientious, patriotic, and he, hear the language just a little bit, uh, maybe Harding-esque, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, informed on government. He had been a state senator and, la and lieutenant governor of Ohio. 
a United States senator before uh, the election to the presidency. One who loved his fellow men and not one who found any satisfaction of thinking or saying ill of him. Surely a great attribute. These are but a few of his characteristics. I've never had a more cooperative or appreciative patient in my long career in practice of medicine, which is now approaching its 50th year. So I want to ask uh, Jim and then Karen, who I believe Karen is the only person who has ever actually read every word oh, no, no, of no, these no, documents. No, you don't think He's so? He's probably read every word. I've well, read every word. But you didn't, you didn't, but he didn't have the whole collection. I didn't have the whole collection, right? I, I, Most I knew there were parts I could, you know, not yeah. worry about. Cause All right, no, but uh, I, uh, I want to ask them not about, Har about Harding's uh, political career, which was, as you just heard, had some very attractive features, but really, what was the man's character? What, what, what sort of character was he? What, uh, okay. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is one of the great stories of the 20th century that's now, you know, coming to light. And uh, my hope is that people will look differently at Warren Harding. We've seen all the titillating things on the internet and John Oliver uh, reading some of these letters. Quite frankly, it's astonishing. Younger people are saying he's their hero now, you know, <laughs> that he had written this way. We don't write letters this way anymore. But these letters truly are. They're over 20 years or over 10 years. And you really do get a sense of his character. Uh, you get to know him from reading these, these letters. This woman, to me, appears to have been the love of his life. And uh, they had both good times and bad times. They, they fought over the First World War. And that's very significant. And I'll tell you why later. But let me give you one example of uh, uh, get an idea for his character. Um, when Florence Harding was very sick in 1913, in the fall of 1913, Carrie Phillips was in Berlin, and he was writing her about his, you know, what was going on in his daily life. And he was taking care of his wife, Florence, uh, eating dinner by himself downstairs. If any of you have ever been to the Harding home, it's still in pristine condition. And this dog showed up at the back door who had been you know, uh, hit by a car twice, he said, was partially blind, had uh, three legs only, and he took pity on this little dog and asked him in uh, to have dinner with him. And so the dog would come in and he would share some stuff with him. And he eventually then, uh, after doing that for several days, found out the dog showed up every day at that time, uh, right, on the, right on the spot, he said. He fed the dog and then later the dog stopped coming and he found out from a neighbor that he had died. And he said, it really is a pity because you know, I, really, uh, I really grew to like this little guy and, and what, what he was and what he was about. You compare uh, Warren Harding's love for animals, for example, he did not hunt, he was not a hunter. He did not believe in that. Compare that to Teddy Roosevelt who liked to go to Africa and slaughter everything in, in his uh, path. And it gives you, you know, these are the sorts of details that give you a feeling for the person and some idea of what their character is beyond this great love affair and beyond this fantastic event of the First World War brewing in the background. Uh, these little intimate details really describe him. And I, Richard, that may be something that uh, you see as similar trait in your family, just a love of animals and so forth. Like yeah, go ahead. Well, I, I would just expand on, on his um, love for his nieces and nephews, that, that uh, they were his, she, he and uh, Florence were childless, and he took them on, and uh, their father was very ill, would go into uh, congestive failure, and nearly died multiple times, uh, turned blue all of a sudden in those days, and there was no treatment, of course. Uh, and he would come, and one, one uh, night, he stayed up all night with his uh, younger brother, who was dying, they, they thought, and kept saying every time he would wake up enough to, to be, get a little bit to drink or something, he kept saying to him, Deacon, because he called him Deacon, he had nicknames for just about everybody, including Florence, but he kept saying, Deacon, I'll take care of the children. Don't worry about the children. I'll take care of them. And he was that kind of a supportive person and um, was um, Uncle Warren uh, to the family. And uh, I guess that's all I'd have to say. Yeah. Aaron, what do you, what's your impression of uh, 
Well, thinking yeah. of yeah, thinking about it, it was something that uh, comes out based on the relationship with Carrie Phillips, and you see in the letters is is uh, loyalty, extreme loyalty. Um, this uh, it really was a political danger for him to continue the relationship with her. She was pushing him away often, especially like after 1914, off and on. And during this time period when he got this letter, uh, you know, trying to uh, ask him about the loyalty, the, she, she wasn't being very friendly to him, but he continued to want the relay. He, he was very loyal. Um, and I guess that's a, a characteristic that some people uh, considered to have caused him problems in his administration, too much loyalty to some of his administration uh, uh, officials. So you can see how sometimes a quality that's uh, very good can also trip you up if you're in a difficult job of the presidency. Let me read to you one passage here on this, uh, his brother being ill. He writes this to Kerry Phillips, uh, and this is in uh, January of 1917, just before the war breaks out. He says to her, you must not wear yourself out. You must save your nerves. So must I. Brother's illness was wholly due to his overwork and weakened resistance, and he had a desperately narrow escape. He is better, and I am so relieved. It has taken a load off my mind. I knew his merits, his usefulness, and that family of four children in mind. He must live for them. Of course, I'd have been a real brother as best I could, but I could not take his place. Oh, it is so good that he is getting better. I could go and it would little matter. So, I mean, you really get into this, uh, this uh, deep love that he had for his family that uh, comes out in these letters too. I've, uh, of course, read Jim's book and um, I'd like to ask again you know, the, character, the character question. Um, it, did Harding, uh, he was from a very religious family, wasn't he? His, uh, his, his, Sister was a missionary, right. Burma, right. and uh, the family was rather devout, I suppose. Right. I didn't detect much kind of moral, uh, uh, the, him uh, being bothered personally by the morality of some of these actions. What, how, would you, how would you assess, I don't ask you to assess his soul, but yeah. is, there any, <laughs> is there any kind of, uh, it, it seemed like it, this didn't, I mean, there were no kind of dark nights of the soul or hand wringing or woe yeah. is me or how did I do that? I mean, is that present at all? Or how do you, what, what's you know, your take on that? You know, it's interesting it is. The, the families here and can speak to, to this, but his mother became a Seventh-day Adventist yeah. uh, when two of her children died suddenly. And this is the way it was back then. You know, two kids get some fever and the next day they're gone. And she became very religious and Adventist, which is one of the reasons all these people are in medicine. They're very medicine, health-oriented. Uh, the, the most famous Adventist institution is the Battle Creek Sanitarium, where Dr. Kellogg was up there and developed cereals and so forth. So they, they have a real strain of Adventism in their family uh, that comes from the mother. Warren, however, was old enough that he had been really raised a Baptist, which his father was, and really didn't himself become an Adventist. Everyone else in the family did. One of the sisters, think about this, in, in 1905 went to Burma as a missionary, medical missionary. Um, so very interesting part of him. But what's interesting is when he gets to the war, and you read these letters around the decision to go to war or not, and he is under enormous strain. His, his lover does not want to go to war. He knows that if he votes for war, uh, that uh, Ohio is filled with German Americans who are mostly Republicans, and it could be his political suicide. He decides to do so anyway. But he also, at one point in these letters, talks about how he silently goes over to pray um, before the Senate is open. They always have the mm -hmm. chaplain of the Senate come out and pray, and he, during that time, went over to try to get guidance, and that he, what, he did pray. But he did not wear religion on his sleeve, but he clearly felt it very deeply. So, so you, don't de you don't detect any great sense of guilt in these letters, do you? Well, there's, there's a sense of guilt. <laughs> uh, he, it's well disguised. Yeah, uh, no, he, you know, he was good friends with, this is one of the odd things of this. This is a very complex story. Jim Phillips was a good friend of his, yeah. Carrie's uh, husband. And um, he did have pangs of guilt. He wrote about it. Uh, Jim, at some point, I'm convinced, found out about it, as did Florence. Uh, and they remained friends in an odd way. Um, but uh, it's, it's one of these stories that, 
you know, you really, you look at these people and you see both of the marriage seem to have had their difficulties. Warren Harding's difficulty was that his wife Florence was so sick that he writes that they were not intimate. So clearly, Carrie was a sexual outlet, and you will see that in spades in these letters. Uh, that's what's on the internet right now. Um, and that's fine. I mean, people should look at that and look at him as a real human being. I've said before, if our ancestors did not have sexual fantasies, none of us would be here today. Um, <laughs> So, and to me, that's great. And uh, Richard, you should tell this story. He just met Patrick Kennedy, Ted Kennedy's son, last week after all this came out. What did he say to you, Richard? Well. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, Kennedy and Harding are the two senators to go straight from the Senate to the presidency, the, the latest being Barack Obama, but it was an unusual thing, so. Well, I, I um, <laughs> but it's a public statement, but uh, in, in so many words, we were having dinner in a, in a group setting for a, a meeting that we were at, and I just leaned over to him and said, you know, Patrick, we have a lot in common. <laughs> and he said, why is that? And he looked at me and said, Warren Harding? <laughs> and, and I said, yeah. And he said, he's my hero. <laughs> and I looked at him like, okay, is this, he's pulling my leg, or is he, you know, he said, no, he's my hero. He said, he has passion. He said, most people don't have passion. And he said, and that's so important to me. And, said, and so he was bringing that up yeah. as being better than the passionless uh, that, that he was comparing uh, people to. There's a letter in this collection dated 1916 written by a lawyer. It's very vague and very obtuse, but it appears that both couples went to this lawyer to talk about the situation. You can read it and draw your own conclusions. I write about it in the book, but I do think that they, the two couples did confront this situation, and he was too far along in politics at that point to get divorced, and um, I don't think he wanted to get divorced at that point, but uh, it, it, it was a truly complex and very nuanced uh, relationship. Yeah. Uh, the matter of passion, though, it, uh, that was one of the, uh, in a way, charged this, some of his critics, political critics made, wasn't it? That he seemed not to have any great vision or uh, any great cause. Right. Is that? Is yeah, that no, I was, I was just about to ask about that this morning on ABC. I did a program with Jonathan Carl, and um, he said almost that exact same thing. And the fact is- I didn't see it, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the fact is, he had his own opinions about what we should be doing. Now, let me tell you one thing that he thought about as we went to war. Think about what happened during the First World War. Every, it was very different than the Second World War. Everybody had blood on their hands. The British, the Germans, the French, everyone, the Russians, everyone had some share of fault. And we were staying neutral. Wilson at the last minute tries to get a peace. It doesn't work. Uh, unrestricted submarine warfare starts up February 1, 1917. And so it, we're being drawn into this war. But Hardy, and so Wilson decides, and he doesn't decide this until the Tsar abdicates in March, that this is going to be a war about democracy. Okay, so we're going to make the world safe for democracy. You remember that phrase. What it really means is we're going to tell the German government to get rid of their Kaiser and to have a democratic form of government. Why? It's more stable. Autocracies are more violent. Um, that, was his, that was his conceit. And he said this. Uh, when he asked to go to war, as I say, after the Tsar dropped out and had abdicated, and there was a, a fledgling democracy in Russia, which Wilson supported. Well, both of those democracies, as you know, the German and the Russian democracies, led straight into chaos and disaster. Um, in Germany, it gives, it, you know, it gives rise to Hitler. In uh, Russia, it gives rise to Lenin and, and the Bolsheviks. Warren Harding, I think, very wisely gets up and says, I am voting for war, but it's only to protect us. It is not for us to tell another government, another sovereign people, what form of government they should have. And he writes a letter to Teddy Roosevelt, and Teddy Roosevelt was with him on this. We should not force democracy on the world, especially places where they're not ready for it. Now, does that sound like something that's a modern theme? Um, and, and here's my point. We get so lost in the myths of Warren Harding and in the, uh, you know, the scintillating things, which, you know, enjoy it as it is, but we lose this essential message that he gave us a hundred years ago that we see being played out in Iraq 
today and the tragedy there. The real issue is, do we have the right to force other people to become a democracy? He said no. He said that's not our business. We should be, we should defend ourselves vigorously, America first, and we should be an example to the world, but we should not go in and change them by force. And you know that played out in Germany, in Russia, played out in Vietnam, and it played out in uh, Iraq. You know, we're having a similar problem in Afghanistan. This is a big theme that comes out of these letters and you know, it's something for people to really focus on and is extremely relevant today. You, you take the position that had it not been for Kerry Phillips that Harding actually might have been elected president in 1916 and we would not have had any uh, ex extravaganza of Wilsonian idealism, is yeah, that true? Yeah, it, 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 as, as was said before, my family was on the Democratic side. So my great-grandfather helped Woodrow Wilson become president of FDR. So I was on that side of it my whole growing up. We had literally in my basement pictures of FDR autographed and a big one of Woodrow Wilson. And the more I studied him, the more I saw that as I got into this, and I had all the myths of Harding in my head when I started looking at this, that had Harding become president in 1916, and he had a good chance to do so, um, it, the world would have been very different, I think. It's always dangerous to do what ifs. You know, what if somebody had done this? But the fact of the matter is, um, he would have gone in and, and won, uh, if he, had he tried, won the nomination instead of Charles Evans Hughes, who was a very lackluster candidate, brilliant man, Supreme Court Justice, Governor of New York, later Harding's Secretary of State, who did the Washington Naval Conference, uh, but not a very good campaigner. And still, Woodrow Wilson al almost did not beat him. And one of the big differences was Ohio. Ohio went for Wilson um, by 90,000 votes, and that was 24 electoral votes at that time. It would have been a landslide the other way for Harding had he won easily, just as he did in 1920 when he beat a fellow Ohio and James Cox, uh, also a newspaper man running for in Cox Communication today. Um, uh, running in 1920. And I think that had Harding been president in 1916, um, that you would have had a different question about whether we got involved in the war, and if so, what the Versailles Peace Treaty would have looked like, and what a, a, a peace negotiated among uh, different nations would have looked like. So it's a it's a good what if question. I do think Kerry. You think, you think Kerry had something to do with his, uh, yeah, he definitely, his decision not to not to run? Yes, he wrote he wrote that. Uh, I think she threatened him at that point. She wanted him out of public life, and she threatened him. And he he writes that he went over to Baltimore and made the thing that made it impossible for him going after what she called his mad pursuit of honors. Uh, and so I think she definitely threatened him, if you do this, um, you know, I, I don't know what, perhaps she would uh, disclose the letters. Uh, but he definitely backed away uh, from that. And he was, he was thought of as a, as a real potential candidate because Ohio had had president after president since after the Civil War. We had eight of them almost in a row, uh, all Republicans. So he was definitely a presidential timber at that point, and, and of course, tw four years later, one went by a landslide. But I think I think world changed. The world changed because of this relationship. It was a world changing relationship. The relationship between Harding and Phillips. Yeah, exactly. That's a rather striking point. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's in the letters. I mean, you, the the thing that you all find when you look at these letters is number one, they're difficult to read. It's handwriting, and number two, you'll have a hard time dating them. He writes Easter. Well, what Easter? You know, March 12. Which March 12? And it took me five years to date these things to be able to write my book. Uh, and uh, it's, you know, it makes a big difference what year. And it takes a lot of work. You have parallel correspondence that he's involved in that helped me do it. And I think I got most of the dates right and almost dated everything. But it's, uh, it's, it's an incredible trove for American history and for people to be uh, looking at and studying and so forth. Let's talk a little bit about Florence Harding. How does uh, one, one reviewer of a, of a book I recently read called her one of the most vilified first ladies in American history. Uh, how does she emerge? What does she look like in, the, in this correspondence? Well, I, I can answer that, but I think, Richard, why don't you start with that, with your family's recollections of Florence and you know, what your, your thoughts are about her. Well, I, I'm not an authority at all on, on Anne Florence, but um, the family felt very positively and lovingly about Anne Florence. She was a good aunt. She cared about the nieces and nephews. 
My father uh, <laughs> one time was in Washington and had a picture taken uh, standing on the parade uh, uh, platform on the front page of the Washington Post with a girl. And he was a young 17-year-old, and there was a girl standing next to him, and he, he, he was the nephew of the president. You know, he got to go stand up there in front. And, of course, the next morning there they were on the front page, and Florence called him in and said, George Harding, uh, who is this woman you were with? <laughs> and, she, and her question was, will she go as far as you're going? <laughs> and just, she had that kind of, she wanted to know what was going on, and she, she was a, a wonderfully warm person at times, but she could also be short at times and quick. When somebody asked her uh, if she had um, done something to the letters uh, after the death, she just kind of flip it. I burned them all. And she hadn't. But she, she, would, she would backhand those kinds of questions sometimes, being kind of irritated with the question. But overall, she was felt to be a very warm and loving aunt by the family. Karen, do you have any yeah, reactions at all about what's Florence? Your thought, Karen? Well, thinking about uh, the display on uh, the rumors of, of Harding that's out there, you could have done one on Florence as well. As soon as you have a, one of the rumors being that Florence poisoned her husband, you know her uh, public relations probably weren't the best. <laughs> um, and not true, just in case you're still wondering, not true, not true. Um, there's there's a wonderful biography uh, uh, by Catherine Sibley in 2009, if anybody's interested in Florence, that, that corrects a lot of uh, misunderstanding about her um, and how she was really a, a, quite a pathbreaker for a, a first lady. Um, in the letters themselves, they, uh, there seems to be an agreement between the two of them that Warren uh, Harding rarely mentions her because it just... Um, makes Carrie very angry. Yeah. Um, so they don't talk about her very much. You, the uh, sense of loyalty I mentioned before, too, might also extend to Florence. Um, he was always aware of her illness. She had kidney disease, and, and every once in a while went through very severe illness. And I don't think he could have left her. I think uh, Carrie Phillips, in the course of a 15-year relationship, it's almost like at the end, it's like watching a bad divorce. Um, and you can tell from the letter, we don't have the first five years where you, where you get dropped in, it's five years along, um, that there was some talk at one point about them leaving their spouses and going out west. Um, but that never happens. And as time goes along, she knows it's not going to, he's not going to leave Florence. He's not going to quit politics. She's left alone. She gets increasingly angry. And Florence has, you know, she just doesn't want to hear about Florence. She is, a, she is a very interesting study of a woman. She was five years older than Harding. Her father was one of the big businessmen in town, and um, Amos Kling was his name. And Harding really did not like him. And he writes about him when he dies in 1913, that he never felt uh, anything for him except uh, unhappiness. Um, she was a strong-willed woman. She was really a business partner with the uh, Marion Star. She helped uh, the Marion Star get off. Uh, she had been married and divorced before she married Warren Harding. She had a son. Uh, her first type of husband was an alcoholic. The son was also, and the two of them had to take care of that son. Um, but she had a very uh, complicated relationship with Warren Harding. I would say it, it is... Uh, in a sense, more of a business type relationship in, in some sense that they really did, uh, he, he prospered with her in terms of both his business and his political career. She had a lot of good insights and she was a very strong woman. Richard and I have talked about this. Why was Warren Harding drawn to such strong women? Um, and the answer I think is that his mother was a very strong woman and a very um, dominant person in that, in that family too. So very complicated story. The, uh, well, let's talk a little bit about uh, Carrie Phillips. What uh, I, I was very impressed with one of these, uh, with Harding's assessment of her in that letter that we found down in the uh, military, Karen found down in the military intelligence folks. Uh, among other things, he said that she's a brilliant woman of intellectual superiority. And then goes on to say, I thought a bit patronizingly, 
I have thought most of it, that's her pro-German uh, 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 diatribes, uh, was due to an egotism in proving a capacity to discuss foreign affairs. You remember, women weren't really supposed to do this, were they? Yeah, it, could you turn on my I, PowerPoint? You want yeah, to see a yeah. picture of Carrie Phillips? Yeah, yeah. Um, Let's I'll just point out, maybe it's not exactly patronizing because he's trying to call the dogs off. Uh, he doesn't want military uh, intelligence investigating her anymore. Um, it, it might also lead to him as well. All right, so what we're showing you here are things that I got from the microfilm. Uh, the letters were discovered in 1960, 900 pages. We've talked about all that. Uh, the lawsuit, this is a picture of that, the 50-year seal away. We've also talked about that. Um, this is the difficult handwriting you'll see in the problems with dating. But it, this relationship started in 1905. That picture, by the way, is the very first thing of, on the collection in the microfilm. It's a picture of Warren Harding from 1910. And on the back side of this, he wrote a love note to her. My darling, you know, my love, et cetera, fills the entire back of, the, of this portrait of him. Um, and then this is a picture that I think is from the Matei collection. Not, you can't see very well, you can see it out front. This is Carrie when she was in Germany. But they begin their relationship in 1905. This is a, one of the, uh, and she goes to Berlin from 1911 to 1914 and becomes very enamored with the city. This is what it would have looked like back when she lived there. So think about an independent woman. That's the first thing I would say about Carrie Phillips. Uh, this, right. is, yeah, right. this is a letter that uh, Harding wrote to her. You can see it's on Kurfürstendamm in Berlin, Germany. You see the words code there. I don't know if you can see it very well. They actually had a code that they came up with to correspond in public letters so that if he said a word like matrix and underlined it, it meant that he loved her more than all the world, that sort of thing. So the, she put the code in this particular one and kept it. That's Berlin again. She was there. And then he runs for senator in 1914, um, thinking that he had lost her. He really believes that um, their relationship was at an end, that she teases him with some uh, uh, jealousy of some German people that she might be uh, hanging out with. And he runs for senator. This is the first time senators are elected uh, by the people of their state. Before that, they were appointed by state legislatures. And he won that uh, going away. He would then have this decision to vote for war. This is a picture of Harding with Woodrow Wilson. Wilson having had his stroke, you can kind of see it there. Uh, but this is another good picture. So this is Carrie Phillips in 1913 when she's in Berlin, and that is her daughter, Isabel, um, who also is a character in all of these things. So the, the love relationship is, um, you know, a dominant in these letters. Um, and, you know, as I say, they even had a, a, a date that they celebrated an anniversary, August 23. It was 1905, well before the war started. The Hardings and Phillipses actually traveled to Europe together in 1909, on some of these grand liners like this. This is the SS Deutschland. Uh, this is the interior of that. And they went to Europe and, and went around Europe for a couple months together. So um, this is the back of that, uh, of that. In 1910, he ran for governor and lost badly. But uh, this is the back of that photograph. You see there, Christmas Eve, 1910. My darling, there are no words at my command sufficient to say the full extent of my love for you, a mad, tender, devoted. This is one of the ones that's quoted in the New York Times. So that gives you a bit of a feel for Carrie Phillips, very independent, independent-minded. Um, I do believe that she became so pro-German that she did get involved in espionage, as do, as do some of the people who are watching her. But uh, it's not a, a sealed case. And I'll be glad to give you some specifics on that if you're interested. But that's kind but of a so, quick answer. So Carrie, uh, what did you think of Carrie? Uh, obviously very bright when I, you, she leaves, the, the stuff that's in there that she wrote is, is mostly notes and the, when she's about to write a letter. And so they're har they're harder to read than, than the Harding letters because, you know, like you and I, if we were writing notes and then we're going to write the letter, that's kind of a bad scrawl. And sometimes it's not complete sentences. Um, but you start following her, argue, she, she writes when she's angry and upset about something. So w when you read the letters, you might get the feeling that she's always angry and upset. Because when she wasn't angry and upset, she didn't have to write a draft. Um, is, and, and, but as time progresses, I think she does get more angry. Uh, 
you imagine uh, like an affair that lasts that long and you have to have this hidden part of your life for this many years and not, you know and then you realize he's just never going to leave you can see where you might start getting a little angry and upset. Um, obviously very bright um, and, and quite knowledgeable, and you start reading her, her uh, objections to World War I, and, you, and I start, yeah, that's a good point. You know? <laughs> so, um, it, so very outspoken, and from other sources, you can see that she was recklessly outspoken, knowing the uh, espionage laws and the sedition laws that for what the things she was saying that you could say that that would interfere with military recruitment and that's a, it was enough to put you in jail. Um, did that to Eugene Debs. Um, but she was reckless in what she said and obviously thought she, maybe she thought she had some protection or she just didn't care anymore. It's hard to tell. Um, luckily, they were rounding up mostly socialists and not Kaiserists. I don't think that's a word. <laughs> uh, so she she didn't have to have to go to jail, but it, it may have um, affected Harding's thoughts about free speech because once he was in uh, in the presidency, he's the one who commuted the sentence of Eugene Debs and had him to the White House right after he was released from prison, and commuted the sentences of a lot of. Uh, uh, like wobblies, uh, you know, various. So th there may be that effect too that the Carrie Phillips um, relationship had on the presidency. Uh, Jim has suggested to me that I think he may have a better sense of the audience. You, you do do a little more. You've been in the public eye a little more <laughs> than I have, obviously. Um, that it's probably time to ask. Uh, we, we certainly hope there'll be questions uh, from the audience and uh, the. My colleagues will try to answer them. Um, so if you raise your hand and speak, yeah, we'll, we'll try to repeat it if we, we have can hear. A, uh, so we have a, a mobile mic, mic back here, and a uh, uh, wireless mic, actually. So uh, so all the way in the back. Yeah, I think right, or the two person. people, two in the back, yeah. I can talk without a mic. I'm, okay. I'm just curious, where, where was Mr. Phillips when Carrie Phillips and her daughter were in Germany for all that time? He was, he was back in Marion. He stayed in Marion. He actually went to visit them over the summer of 1913 and then came back with, Harding said, a nice little mustache. And, and uh, he took him, uh, he, helped, he came over and helped him unpack and come back. He was um, in some of these letters where we have the, the military authorities following Carrie Phillips and Isabel as they traveled around thinking they were involved in espionage. Um, he is referred to by some of the local people as he is a tool of his wife, uh, T-O-O-L. And I thought, well, who isn't? But, um, <laughs> but, but he, you know, it's, uh, he's a guy who, it's, it's unfortunate that we don't know more about this family, Carrie in particular. We only see her in reflection as he writes about her. And Jim, we know very little about other than he remained friends with Warren Harding and was a, a good businessman in town. And he yeah. stayed, yeah. you know, he, she traveled a lot during the war, too. She was rarely home. I'd like to add something about, about what Florence and Jim knew. I'm not clear. They probably knew some. It's really not clear. So anyone who wants to look into it, I think that's still kind of an open question. It, it just seems so strange. Or if they knew, maybe they knew a little something, but not everything. Because if they knew everything, I can't figure out how, how such cordial relationships would have continued. I mean, he's still sending him, uh, Harding sending Jim Phillips a Christmas present, a send him a box of cigars. Uh, it, it just seems too weird to me that if they knew it all, how could they still be that friendly with one another? another it we just it's just a missed one of those mysteries we don't really know exactly okay. another, another one in the back go ahead why don't we come up here go ahead yeah yeah you have a question okay i guess it's operating yeah. yeah like jim i'm a diplomatic historian and i'm a little taken by the argument about the forces of the U.S. government, knowing the United States senator supposedly was affiliated in some form or fashion with a person who was supposedly a highly potential spy for the Germans, right. ended up not being prosecuted, not being 
investigated to the extent that something actually came to pass. That was a hell of a time. There was a lot of stuff going mm -hmm. on. Yep. People were being rolled up that were not necessarily yeah. Eugene Debs. Right. I, I'm just curious about the evidence you can bring to bear on that, because that's well, I'll tell you the evidence. That's core of your book. Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you the evidence. The evidence is, and you can find this, there is a memo written to the Attorney General of the United States. Thomas Watts was his name, Wilson's Attorney General, saying that uh, Senator Harding appears to be having an affair with Mrs. Phillips and that there are all these allegations about her being a spy. And it goes all the way to the, to the uh, Attorney General and the, the, the head of the what was called the Bureau of Investigation. This is pre-J. Edgar Hoover a guy named uh, Belaski, um, writes and says, we think that we can get Jim Phillips based on what he said to undercover agents in Cincinnati that was very pro-German and very much, um, you know, it, we're in the wrong war, the Germans are going to beat us, and uh, et cetera. Wilson bit off more than he could chew. Um, he spoke to these undercover agents. We believe we can get him once we pass the Sedition Act which prohibited speaking against the war um, in any form. I mean, it, it, you talk about pure free speech. But uh, a memo goes all the way to the Attorney General. They know about this. The, the authorities know about it um, from the local people who have told them about it. Um, and they even talk about Senator Harding being caught in a compromising position with Mrs. Phillips in a local town. So they very much know about it, but they, uh, they walk very gingerly. And my question was, when I wrote my book and I write at the end of it, why didn't they use it in the 1920 campaign uh, when they knew about it? The Democrats clearly knew about it, uh, and they didn't use it. And you can read my book and find out what my answer is on that. <laughs> yeah. But a, a memo went to the Attorney General. I mean, this was not something that was yeah. way low down. I would point out, though, that there's a difference between being guilty of the sedition laws and being a paid spy. Mm. The, the, yeah, I mean, there were a lot of people. The, the way the sedition laws, if we had to live under them today, we would all object. Yeah. Um, let, and, let me read you one thing here. This is February 14, 1918. And there was a group that arose after we got in, involved in the war called the American Protective League. The American Protective League was 250,000 businessmen across the country in every city being essentially deputized by the Attorney General of the United States, uh, given badges that said APL, American Protective League, and these people really spied on their neighbors. Were, were people violating the Neutrality Act at that time? Were they pro this or pro that? There was actually a chief of the American Protective League and a lieutenant in Marion, Ohio, Little Marion, Ohio. So it tells you how pervasive this was. He wrote a letter, February 14, 1918, to the chief of the American Protective League here in Washington, D.C., a guy named Charles Fry. And he says, the captain of the merchant's division within Marion, so some merchant, in our organization was detailed on the case, and we are now convinced that these parties are German spies and that they are receiving money from the German government. We believe this to be an extremely serious case and one that demands the services of the strongest, strongest secret service detective you have to wind it up. Uh, so that's February of 1918. Now, the war ends and Carrie subsides after Harding warns her in these letters, you're being followed. Uh, and they know about what's going on. I don't believe you're a German spy, but whatever you're doing, stop it. You're about to be arrested. He calls it the great embarrassment. And he's and, he, and even he's so desperate about it, he writes Jim Phillips a separate letter saying, I've written her a letter. We've got to do something about this. She mm -hmm. subsides. The war ends in November 1918, yeah. and people are through with wanting to worry about spies and, and so forth, and it, it goes away. Uh, but... Uh, definitely, I'm, I'm telling you, the records are there that these people thought that. And there were affidavits they got from people where Kerry was, had said, I'm being paid by the German government, and I don't give a goddamn who knows about it. Um, so and that's, that's somebody's affidavit. Is it true? I don't know. Read the evidence and take a look. But yeah, uh, Well, it's there. We, uh, we respectfully, I respectfully disagree because, as you may have seen in the New York Times article, I, I've been reading some of the German language sources especially a book by a, a, a Dorius, who's a great expert on German intelligence during the First World War. And he also wrote about a book on Bernstoff, the German ambassador, who and points out uh, that the um, Bernstorff was reading all the dispatches of, of his subordinates, 
And surely, well, I didn't, that's not, there's no mention whatsoever of Kerry Phillips. If the Germans had actually placed a spy in Warren Harding's bedroom, would they not have been congratulating themselves and writing this, informing Berlin of this? Uh, I mean, to me, it's, it's, it's simply, I mean, we don't know. I mean, there may be some place now in an archive in some obscure place in Germany that survived this, the Second World War where you might have a list of people who were getting some money. But until that list uh, uh, is discovered, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a skeptic. And secondly, these people in the Bureau of Investigation and the American Protective League were, were wretched. Uh, uh, they were uh, the worst sort, not, I mean, not good, but they were, they were simply uh, inept, ill-informed. Uh, we have a guy, and I don't know whether he's still in the audience, one of our staff members has written an article about their treatment of Mennonites during the uh, First World War. Is he, is, Alan, are you here? No. Him. Can you talk a little bit about that? About the about the information they de they developed on Mennonites, the the Bureau of the American Protective League, and the Bureau of in of Information. Um, I mean, these people are totally unreliable. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, in in brief, Mennonites were pacifists, and they were also connected to in a German background by and large. They spoke a German language, lived in the Midwest, which uh, Ohio and and further west of the Plain States. So there were all kinds of reasons to be suspicious of them. But the point of the article was that um, uh, Bureau of Investigation reports, MID reports were, were based, they sound very much like the kinds of reports that I've, that I've seen that Karen found at the National Archives about the Phillipses. They pick up on comments from neighbors. I mean, it was not uncommon at all, uh, just generally for, for in small towns for people to be suspicious of the woman next to them who was wrapping bandages. If she was German-American, she may be putting glass in the, you know, in the bandages, that kind of thing. You couldn't. But, and so the point was that uh, there was tremendous amount of misinformation in terms of Mennonites being described uh, confusedly as being uh, descended from Scottish uh, missionaries in the Midwest in 1900, being involved with the Bolshevik movement in, in the then so becoming Soviet yeah. Union, um, kidnapping uh, Chinese uh, mission, Mennonite missionaries in, in China. So it's yeah. just a melange of mistakes, um, yeah. and it's just a, an yeah. accumulation of inept uh, information yeah. leading I mean, to dire results yeah, in yeah. some, some, some cases. So I'm very were, suspicious yeah. in this case yeah. also like well, you. Well, uh, you know, uh, uh, remember the Mennonites were 16th century deserters, d d I mean dissenters, <laughs> dissenters. <laughs> And to have had these people, somebody following around believing that they were con converted by Scottish missionaries in the 19th century is, 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 is staggering. And a dire threat. But I mean, yeah. my point is, and that's a relatively mild case. I mean, if, if one was a socialist at that point, the circumstances would have been much worse. But uh, the point is that the information these people were, were reporting, I think, and uh, respectfully disagreeing is uh, almost most of it is just based on local gossip and rumor, uh, and certainly we know that the people in the people in Marion thought Carrie was a German spy. But uh, yeah. this, by the way, is a picture of the American Protective League. If you look here, a card it says organized with the approval and operating under the direction of the United States Department of Justice Bureau of Investigation. So they really had this. I agree with you wholeheartedly. They were a very dangerous organization and they ran roughshod over a lot of people during this time. Let me tell you one other fact that was important to them in, in their thoughts about why they thought that, that uh, Kerry was involved with, eh, this is not gonna go all the way back. Lieutenant Pickhart was the guy who, who Isabel was engaged to. Uh, he was on the USS New York and they discovered that engagement. Pickhart's first cousin was a woman named Iona Pickhart who became a German baroness, uh, and her name was Baroness Zollner. Uh, a month after Warren Harding is confronted by the military intelligence about Carrie and Isabel, uh, this woman is caught in a bed uh, with an officer half her age down in Georgia outside Camp Oglethorpe, um, and she has in her purse a code telling her when ships were gonna leave. What the Germans were interested in is how quickly the United States was gonna mobilize and get into the war. 
That relationship led to the uh, Cleveland Plain Dealer writing an article, Love Tricks of Women Spies, and it names Iona Pickhart by name, and the, the guy there says, aha, I know that name because I've been looking at letters between Lieutenant Pickhart and Isabel Phillips. He, she's engaged to him, and it's the same family. Um, so that's what caused them to conclude that there was some relationship here. Uh, the, the Baroness was arrested for espionage, charged with espionage. She went to a preliminary hearing before a magistrate. He found probable cause that she should be tried for espionage, and she was never tried, which is one of the mysteries of this book. Why did that happen? Uh, I've got some theories about that, but that's what really set them on fire and made them really focus closely on Carrie and Isabel, because Isabel was engaged to Lieutenant Pickhart, and her, this guy's first cousin had been arrested uh, outside of camp, just as they were outside of camp, yeah. uh, and so forth. So that's that's where some of that evidence so, comes from. Uh, so this question, this discussion is probably going nowhere. Uh, the disagreement. But uh, how about some other questions? Over here. here yeah, over here. Marvin. Yeah. Here. Please, the, the handsome man who's going to be standing up here has an interesting story. This is Marvin Kranz, a former, uh, one of our former very good specialists. Uh, this uh, is a story that's a little bit lighter than what you've been hearing about spies and so forth. But uh, uh, at a time when many of you remember a president uh, left some semen on a blue dress, <laughs> I had a reporter from the New York Times come in and ask me, did we have any examples of other presidents uh, uh, having uh, affairs of one sort or another? I might have mentioned uh, uh, President Wilson and his love affair during the middle of the war in which he married uh, his second wife. And the, the, the letters in, those, in that collection is pretty, uh, pretty racy, but that's been published. So I said, uh, but uh, do you know about the uh, uh, relationship between uh, Miss Phillips and uh, Warren Harding? And he says, well, what, what's that all about? I said, well, there are letters uh, with uh, Warren Harding's uh, mistress in our collection. He says, oh, can I see him? I <laughs> said, I'm sorry, you have to wait till 2014. <laughs> so he went back to the Times with that story, and about a week later, I got a call from somebody at the New York Times, and she said, uh, Dr. Kranz, he said, uh, can, uh, I know we can't read the letters, but can we photograph them? <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, so I said, not really, because that's the same thing. But uh, I said, uh, but she said, well, can we see the, the containers that they're in? I said, sure. <laughs> and we made an appointment for about nine days later, ten days later, and we set up our conference room, and three photographers came down to Washington, and they were staying at the Mayflower Hotel, and they came in, and I went into our safe, our vault, and I got the, the two or three boxes of the Phillips, car, Phillips Harding correspondence uh, down. I took the correspondence out and put it back on the shelf, and I brought out these empty boxes. <laughs> <laughs> and the photographers took these boxes, and they sat around, and they spent three hours photographing <laughs> empty <laughs> containers that had, had the correspondence in. Nothing ever came of it, but I thought it was a wonderful story when we talk about government waste. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just take just a few more and wrap up. All right, yeah. Just a few more, I think, then we'll wrap. In the middle here, yeah. Madame? Oh. Hello? Uh, I've read all of the material that's been published, um, which, of course, if you go to the library on Harding, it's maybe not this big uh, compared to the Washington and Lincoln material. So I'm probably misguided on a lot of things. Uh, but um, one of the things that uh, I, I recall is a um, uh, reading about is the promise, maybe, to the, that some authors have said that uh, Harding made to uh, Nan Britton about, well, she won't last long. Was that ever uh, a theme in the letters that there is an expectation that um, Florence would pass on because of her continuing illnesses, that this was a promise that, that uh, for Carrie to, to um, 
continue to think that there is a possibility of something uh, in the future because of the ill health of uh, Florence? Um, there is suggestion in the letter that she is not going to last multiple times, and there are multiple times where she is on her deathbed, but I don't see a direct, we just have to wait for her to die and, and things will work out. I don't see that at all. He, just the opposite. He says, you know, I, I, who could leave someone in this, in this shape? You know, uh, I would never do that. So, uh, it's more that sort of discussion than any. Yeah, Leslie. Uh, so last, last. We'll question here one more this guy's okay okay great. um i find these letters fascinating because in the day of internet we no longer have correspondence um, that just vanishes into thin air um i'm curious um how many letters were there um, i know there's lots of papers and each letter might have contained 10 pages or 20 pages or um, more some or more. up to 40. Yeah. up to 40. and and how i know people sneak around texting and, you know, kind of, how did they get these letters? Do you have the envelopes? Um, how did they, how did they address them to each other or get them to each other? Well, we also have a lot of envelopes that don't have letters. So somebody can also, you can tell that there are blank spots, but there were probably writing and the letter didn't get saved, but we, we have extra envelopes. Yeah, there, there are about, I would say about 106 letters altogether. Some of them are 40 pages long. Some of them written on Senate stationery as, in, as he's in some of these great debates about the war. Uh, but one thing he did do is he wrote what he called a public letter. So the first five pages would be breezy, what's going on. He would mail that and she could show that letter to Jim. The last 15 pages were the the love letter. So he did a lot of that and a lot of um, envelopes within em envelopes. Um, so uh, they definitely went back and forth on all of this. One more over here is a very impatient. Yeah. 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 <laughs> if we knew our grandparents at all, know them from photographs of people in strange clothing and starched collars. I wanted to ask Dr. Harding what it says to all of us that here is someone who is capable of mad, tender, devoted, ardent, eager, passion, wild love. <laughs> what, what does that offer to all of us? Is that a glimpse Pardon possibly of all of our? I'm sorry, I missed the, uh, the quote. I got you right to the quote. The quote, the quote is for, from the letter that was on the screen that he's writing about his mad, tender, devoted, ardent, eager, passion, wild, jealous, reverent, wistful, hungry, happy love <laughs> um, from someone who we know only is from photographs of a politician. What does that say for all of us? That, are we all descended from people who are capable of that? These people in these old photographs? You're, you're a psychologist. <laughs> o only us lucky ones. <laughs> the, the, I, think, I think one of the one of things that you have to keep in mind is that this is a newspaperman who wrote for a living. And people always say that he was a crummy writer and he was a crummy talker and he was a, you know, all this stuff that, that has been handed down. But he was articulate and he, he wrote well. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, love letters uh, generally tend to be um, immature, adolescent even. But that would be typical of almost everybody in writing a love letter. I mean, it's not easy to write a mature love letter. <laughs> um, so, yes. so he, he, was, he was articulate, um, a little bit, uh, I would have preferred that he not write quite so many, or, or <laughs> I, would, I have lots of, of feelings about things, but, yeah. but uh, I think that it's what I would expect uh, from someone who was passionately in love, and he was. It was uh, probably the love of his life, and, and I, it's, it's sad to me as a family member, because I through my father, loved my Aunt Florence, who was a wonderful person. But their relationship was different. It was more of a, um, uh, well, as mentioned, I think earlier, kind of a business relationship between Warren and Florence, that they understood each other. They probably knew about what was going on, but uh, they, they worked together and their love uh, held. And he wouldn't have left her for nothing, right. in my opinion. I agree. I agree. Okay. Whereas this other person um, had a different relationship, and I wish that it could have been one person that got both ends of that, mm -hmm. but that's not the way it worked out. But I'm sure in you all's families, it has been that one person. <laughs> uh, oh, that's uh, congratulations. That's a, that's a 
That, that's, a great way, that's a great way to end. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.